Welcome back to the Loopcast. Today, you just got me and Josh. We're going with a. Yeah. Uh, I feel like we're back That's on our okay. St. Joseph. Remember, we did the St. Joseph uh, novena. Yeah, the consecration. That's right. And that was our. Well, yeah, consecration. That was our first foray into like just me and you. And I think we we make an okay duo. I mean, what am I? I'm right, Batman, and you're Little cast. Robin. No, I don't like that at all. <laughs> Not even a little bit. Uh, but happy Friday to everyone. Oh man, I'm already getting stash comments. Awesome from the chat. What's up to everyone joining live? It's just crazy me how much we've grown. Um, so I just want to throw out there first before we get into the episode, we have a little bit of a relaxed Friday. News is a little bit slower. And as we've grown, I think there's a lot of new people in the chat or maybe new people to the Loopcast. I want to offer it out. FAQ Friday. What do you guys want to know? Uh, do you want to know something like about it. us personally? Do you have questions going on in the news you want us to talk about? Faith stuff? culture stuff uh i see a lot of comments about the stash so i mean i'm happy to tell you more about that but yeah so just uh throw those out i'm gonna have our producer rosie kind of pick some up so that i can have a section of the show where i'm just answering just what you guys want to know um but before that you know best way to help out the show leave a like on this uh leave us a review on apple Podcasts and spotify it's the best way to help the show you can email me at loopcast at catholic and become a champion consider donating that's the only way we get support here that's how we're able to do what we do so I see uh, you're, you're just wearing the so casual Friday. You're wearing this whole Detroit Lions thing really to rub it in the nose of my boy, J.J. McCarthy. Uh, got <laughs> hey, injured I, the Vikings. I, I would have had my Vikings mug out, but I forgot it. I genuinely feel bad about that. I think I saw like a stat line of all the things that have happened to the Vikings in like the span of two days. It was like your starting cornerback died. Rest in peace. I mean, pray for the repose of his soul. He died in a car accident. And then J.J. McCarthy out for the year, torn meniscus. The next cornerback up pour something too it's just it's looking it's not looking good why you know oh it's, gosh it's rough you're not talking about tim walls are you yeah no i meant the addison kid oh yeah that part. was unfortunate and yeah but the lions full steam ahead super bowl calling it now you guys can clip this remind me when we probably don't but well the we oracle do. says unfortunately i think the packers are gonna defeat you for i hate title. that take i really hate that take because I, I don't that's not what i like <laughs> I, i'm just telling you <laughs> Cool. If we got any Lions fans in the chat, let me know. Lions are overrated. I need some support. But if we get into today's topic, so Kamala Harris just announced some of her first policies, I think, of her campaign. And we get into Kamalanomics, as I'm calling it. So some of the first mm. proposals, I'm just going to give a broad summary of what she's thrown out there so far. She's going to announce more at her rally uh, today. But we have uh, price controls. So she is recommending to some anti-gouging measures, as she's calling them. Us in the economics community call that price controls. Uh, she recommended a 6K tax credit for children. She off is offering 25K to first-time home buyers. Also, she is announcing that there's some type of incentive structure with builders to build homes more geared towards first-time home buyers. Not sure the specifics on that. And yeah, I think that's... That's taking on big pharma. She's saying she's doing some caps on insurance stuff, some caps on drugs. She's unveiling all this on Friday. Now, if this sounds familiar to you, it should, because uh, just about three weeks ago, I think she was ripping on J.D. Vance for the tax credit. I have a screen share to prove it here. Oh, it's not being shared. Let me pull that up. Go ahead, Josh. I'll set that up real quick. What? Mm -mm. Sorry. It, you know, it, it's never, we never go without some sort of tech issues. I, right. I swear like the, the devil's after us every time, <laughs> but you know, that you're, you're right because it was just JD Vance over the weekend that had talked about a $5,000 child tax credit. And then a couple of weeks earlier, you're right. The, the Kamala campaign was like, how dare you say that, you know, the, some people should have to pay higher taxes than others. Yeah. I have the clip. Oh, we got the clip now. Yep. That problem. You know, I think it's simple. And I'll go back to something I said earlier about we need to reward the things that we think are good and punish the things that we think are bad. So you talk about tax policy. Let's tax the things that are bad and not tax the things that are good. If you're making a hundred thousand dollars, four hundred thousand dollars a year, and you've got three kids, you should yeah. pay a different lower tax rate than if you're making the same amount of money and you don't have any kids. It's that simple. I you know, totally agree. We, we, so for the audio listeners, this is from Kamala HQ. She said, J.D. Vance says adults without children should have their taxes raised because we should, quote, punish the things we think are bad, end quote. 
I mean, think on that. I, I think he could have set it up a little bit better. Like if you're going to talk about the, using the tax code to punish the things that are bad, then you say like, you know, sin taxes like gambling or marijuana. Like if you're going to have this stuff illegal or have this stuff be legal, tax it at a higher rate because you want kind of less of it. But then it, you don't want to come off sounding like you want less, you know, use the tax code to say to tax people who don't have enough kids. You should only focus on the positive because there are people who would like to have more kids who maybe don't have any kids at all and they'd love to have kids. So you, sh- you should always try to frame it, frame it, I would say, in the positive. So some people, uh, pro-family people said, oh, uh, Kamala is kind of attacking him a little bit unfairly. It's like, well, he did kind of frame it in a way that allowed them to say, are you saying that it's bad not to have kids? So, you know, I, I would have not done that, you know, but again, it's one of those interviews off the cuff, you know, hour long conversations. You're just kind of riffing. And of course, anytime you have something like that a couple of years ago, long conversation, you can, you know, kind of chop it up in certain ways. I know what he means, like in general, like the tax code, like if you want, if you think there's a problem with too much, like, you know, um, Chinese imports that are undercutting certain markets, then yeah, you punish that with a tariff or something like that. So that, you know, this idea that we have to be completely purely libertarian and all economic policies, I disagree with. I think we can, you know, uh, punish the things that we think are bad. So, you know, yeah, you know, tax gambling, tax marijuana, whatever the heck it is. I'd rather not have marijuana legal anyway. Yeah, but, by you're, the way, but you're zeroing in on the specifics of what he said. You're not even talking about the shamelessness of just straight copying. I mean, he proposed a 5K child tax credit. She just ups it to six and pretends like she never criticized him for it. And what he said, now here's the thing. A lot of pro-family Catholics are going to say 5,000, 6,000, both these sound great. We love it. And by the way, as a father of six, I don't hate the idea of a child tax credit being increased, obviously, especially as I'm looking at tuition bills for three different Catholic schools next year. Oh, 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 painful. So, but we have to think about this. There, what, what the Kamala Harris campaign is intending to do is to use an expanded child tax credit like they did before when they had the, uh, when they first got into office with the COVID bill. They want to use it as basically uh, taking money from the rich and giving it to the poor in a sense. Because what they want to do is have a completely refundable. What does this mean? Like some of this stuff gets weird. But the whole point is like, let's say you have, you know, the child tax credit goes up to 5K. Okay, great. So I have six kids. That's $30,000 in taxes I could get credits against. That's pretty awesome, right? Well, what if I only paid like $15,000 in taxes? Well, then the, the tax code would say, well, okay, you're not going to pay 15000 anymore. You pay zero. That's awesome. But what they want to make by, by making it refundable is you would get the full $3,000 no matter how much you paid in taxes. Well, what if I only paid like $3,000 in taxes? I would get a check for $30,000 minus the three, you know, like that, like that's crazy. Why would I get 27,000? That's like, that's not a tax credit. It's basically just a welfare payment at that point. You know, so that's the concern is that the democratic party realized they can mobilize the child tax credit as a welfare payment by just making it quote fully refundable. Now I would actually be sort of okay with this because look, we don't just pay income taxes. We pay Social Security taxes too, and so maybe what we do—I don't know why I get that bubble up now. That was funny. Maybe what we should do is um, offer up, you know, like that the tax credit could count against both your income tax as well as your Social Security taxes. But then it should only be up to how much tax dollars you pay. You shouldn't just suddenly get like massive checks for every kid you have from the federal government. That doesn't seem to be the right idea at all. I appreciate the deep analysis. I I mean, to me, I just think this is the entire strategy has been good vibes on the Kamala side and then just copy everything Trump does. I mean, we get tax on tips. We get a child credit. Now it's like, take all the best. Now she's tough on the border, right? Tough on the border. It's, it's, uh, it really is a test to me in how much you can just gaslight and and change your positions at the last second, change your candidate at the last second and see what sticks. I mean, it, it, it's so shameless. I saw we got a uh, cave bear in the chat. I've got an idea, lower inflation and basic costs, and maybe taxpayers could afford purchasing a new house. Do we really need more bonus tax incentives from one hand while overtaxing with the other? Now, I thought a lot about this. And the one that really stuck out to me about all of her proposals here is the uh, price controls, because I even saw an opinion from the Washington Post 
opinion, when your opponent calls you a communist, maybe don't propose price controls. And <laughs> spot on. Pretty good idea. Pretty good idea. And because I was just thinking, like, even the term price controls, I know she's talk, calling it anti-gouging, which is kind of a cute way of saying it. I mean, got to brush off my econ- economics hat here for a second. It this never makes works. Me so mad. It this never makes works. So mad. And we have so many examples of it not working. I mean, I think to Russia, I think to China and as of recent Venezuela. And I've actually had a few people ask me, hey, what was that chart that Josh read down on Venezuela? Because we covered the election and then we covered how quickly they kind of fell into communism. And if you guys don't mind, I like basically someone was like, hey, just look into Venezuela. You'll find out exactly what happens with price controls. And I was like, OK, I just genuinely was curious. I'm not super familiar. So I went in and did a bunch of research. And uh, yeah, it's not great. Uh, <laughs> we had it in our own country, too. We had it. in this. It, I love Richard Nixon, but he screwed up with price controls in the early 70s. And Ford and Carter both implemented it in different ways. Uh, Jimmy Carter, he basically said, we're going to do price controls on gasoline because it's getting out of hand because, you know, OPEC kept driving the prices up and they could control supply. And it's hard to do a monopoly, but they were able to kind of make it work a little bit. And so the price kept going up. And so Jimmy Carter said, well, we're not going to let you sell gas for more than this amount. Well, then what happened? Everyone had waited in line for gas and there was shortages. Yes, because lines, yeah. Could, yeah. So like, this is not the solution. Like, What's well, funny you mentioned yeah, we, OPEC because we've been there like that before. So Venezuela made their money off of oil. They're like a petro state, and you, you, they Hugo Chavez gets elected in the nineties, late nineties, think ninety eight, and before that they they made almost all their money off oil. They were the third richest country in the hemisphere. And fast forward to today, ninety five percent of Venezuelans live in poverty. Seventy five percent in what's considered extreme poverty. So short period of time, you go from all this wealth to not having it sitting on the most valuable natural resource in the world right now, oil. So it's like, okay, well, how did that happen? And if you guys will humor me, I did the research and I have a little bit of a line to draw through it. So basically, Hugo Chavez came in at a time where there was uh, corruption in the previous government and a lot of uh, economic disparity at the time. So the conditions for a new leader like this were there. So he actually attempted a coup before he was elected democratically, and the previous leader made the mistake of pardoning him. But he rises to power, he gets elected, he rewrites the Constitution, okay? So in 2003, he institutes a price ceiling on staple food items, okay? So not dissimilar of what we're seeing now, and this is all part of what he calls the Bolivarian, the Bolivarian missions. The aim was to ac- ac- expand access to housing, healthcare, and food. All very similar to what we're hearing now from Kamala Harris. So this is not like there's not applications. So there's an abundance of instances in 2009 after these price caps where Hugo Chavez was ordering the military to seize rice farms and make them produce at full capacity, which Chavez feared they were withholding from considering the price ceiling. So basic economics, I'm just going to go on the the summary before we go into it. Uh, We have when price ceilings are implemented, the price coordination mechanism is flipped an artificially low price set by the government leads to a spike in demand, whereas the producers are not willing to sell at the price considering that their profit margin margins drop considerably. As demand exceeds supply, shortages emerge and consumers are left to cope with them or deal with inferior quality goods in the market. This leads to lower consumer welfare. Examples of this is this burgeoning black market that developed in Venezuela where doctors and lawyers were making more money smuggling food into the country than their actual profession, which is crazy to think, but this is all happening in the early 2000s. So the government imp- imposed this fair price goods and goods simply weren't available at the markets because it wasn't profitable for pr- producers. I mean, basic supply and demand. Uh, so in 2008, we see the government of Venezuela spending nearly $7.5 billion in procuring bra- basic food items, but even then, high levels of incompetence and deep-seated corruption led to the food rotting before it could even reach the supermarket shelves. The food shortage rates rose between 10% and 20% from 2010 to 2013. By mid-2011, food prices soared to nine times as high as they were before the price controls. So then you get in 2014, Chavez's successor, Nicolas Maduro, who's currently battling... Also a bad dude. Bad dude, battling to keep his power right now. He passed the Fair Prices Act through which it banned profit margins above 30%. And chalked Uh... out... Here we go and chalked out prison terms for offenders of hoarding and overcharging. 
to ensure that the government's socialist economic strategy, informally called Dicazo, was being upheld, Maduro sent out inspection teams comprising of inspectors, lawyers, military personnel to check on fair prices, quote unquote, to carry out his Merry Christmas plan. Maduro spent a, sent about 33,000, 3, actually no, 34,000 officials as part of inspection teams to monitor the prices at the malls and shopping centers around the country. You know, the thing, here's the thing, here's what happens. Okay. So in our own country, we shut down, you know, like 50% of our economy because of the COVID thing, which, you know, after a couple of weeks, I thought, okay, you said two weeks for a cure. Why is this like two months in some States, two years, like this is getting ridiculous, you know, and it's not helpful for our economy. But Trump said, well, look, if people aren't, aren't able to get work, we got to at least throw them some money so that they have some assistance or whatever. And then we did that for a while. And then as things were starting to thaw and get better, it's like, OK, let's open up the economy. Let's move things along. But Biden gets into power. He's like, no, no, no. We need to do another big, fat, massive you know, bill giving out tons of money. And I remember saying, like, OK, great. I'll take my check. But this is dumb. This is going to be really bad. Oh, the stimmy You're checks? going to overheat the economy. There's going to be too many dollars in the market and they're going to be chasing goods. And what people are going to do is they're going to take advantage of the low interest rates. They're going to buy up houses and suddenly, you know, people are going to get more house than they can afford, but the such low rates, they won't care. And then the people after them aren't going to be able to buy houses. Hello. That's what we're dealing with right now. And also everything is going to go up. I'm, I, you know, my, my wife would be like, oh, my gosh, the cost of eggs. Have you seen this the cost of milk? I'm like, yeah, well, if suddenly the money has become funny and like, oh, if we owned a house, you know, still because we don't we're, we're rent right now. If we owned a house, it would be worth so much more. If we hadn't sold that house, it's worth so much more money. It's like, is it really worth that much more money or is our money worth less than it is? Right. Well, you, you know, know? And, and here's the thing. What's going to happen? The prices creep up. So cost of eggs, the cost of milk, the cost of bacon, it all goes up. Right. Mm -hmm. And then and then what invariably happens? The Democrats say price gouging. You have Elizabeth Warren and right. you have now Kamala Harris saying, oh, the cost of all this stuff. They're greedy. They're greedy. And I think to myself, wait a minute, corporations are suddenly greedy now that you're in power. Right. And they weren't greedy when Trump was in power. Maybe we should vote for Trump again so we don't have our co corporations being greedy again. Oh, well, Josh, you know, but if you think about it, I'm thinking I have to say, do you remember who passed the tie breaking vote on the Inflation Reduction Act? That is Vice President Kamala Harris. Correct. We owe her that. And here's the thing. What is the profit margin on grocery stores? What do you think it is? I'm mean, Honestly, I know the answer. I just want to see. I'm not going to I'm putting you on the spot. Just random person guessing because you probably haven't done the research. I don't expect you to know. What do you think is the average profit margin for these grocery stores that are just, you know, making so much money. This is the vice president of the United States is so angry about these grocery stores and the massive profit margins they have. What do you think is the profit margin for grocery stores last year? Last year. Chats can throw out some guesses too. I'm going to say 10%. 10%. Hmm. Let's see what the chat says. What do we got, anyone? Oh, Amory Sullivan for the win. She got it. 1%. That is, it is crazy. literally 1.2% profit margin. So when you buy a hundred dollars of groceries, that grocery store is profiting an evil dollar and 20 cents. <laughs> wow. That is, I mean, come on people. Like there's certain industries where the profit margins are just not that big. I mean, the local Kroger or, you know, whatever is not able to make as much money because there's a bunch of grocery stores out there, you know, like the convenience store you go to like, Oh, well, they, they get charged so much more for eggs. Their profit margin must be super high. Like, no, it's not actually that much higher. They just pay a higher rate because they're not able to get it at a discount because they don't buy 10 million eggs like Walmart does. Yeah. So, Profit margin, like it's like it's a joke. I mean, the federal government's already taken twenty percent of their profits anyway through the corporation tax. I mean, give me right. a break. And then it's a regulation problem. I mean, so much of this is a regulation problem. Even with the twenty five k to first time home buyers, do you know how much houses are probably going to go up by if you had to take a wild guess? It's one of those things. Twenty five k. It's the same thing you and I talked about with college stuff. 
we need to provide more college aid to families so that they can get college. And then the college is like, who's super yes. more money. Now no, that's, I can raise the prices. That's exactly what I thought of. I was like, look how great FAFSA has been for the price of college. Like they just increase it by the amount they know you're going to get loaned. Why would it be any and different here? Since I just filled out all these forms recently, Tom, <laughs> let me just tell you, I love <laughs> our new federal government. They made the FAFSA form so much better. They streamlined it and they looked at my income and they said, oh yeah, you guys should be... I love the emojis that pop up for some reason. You should be able to pay, you know, $19,000, your family to help your first kid go through college. I'm like, I, you know, I have six of these. And so like, if I have three kids in college at the same time, I'm just going to be writing $60,000 in checks to all my kids. Who go college. I mean, am I not going to eat that year? I'm like, what, what are these people saying? Well, it's they, like, it's ridiculous. They, I'll it, just turn the heat off. Didn't they add a bunch of new pronouns though, to the FAFSA form? So uh, now it's I'm more sure inclusive. Yeah. So yeah, uh, FAQ for the show, because it's FAQ Friday. Basically, if you make certain motions on our side, we see like balloons or bubbles pop up, but it, I don't think it gets streamed out. Like I'm seeing the stream right now and it's not getting sent to you, but just know it, it's, I feel like it's kind of like that ESPN program where they like hit a button. If someone makes a good point, it's like Josh made a good point balloons. So this is the kind of stuff we deal with on our end. Crazy yeah, tech. Economics. I feel like it's pretty simple. In a lot of ways, don't. And, and this is what's so frustrating to me about Kamala Harris as a whole. I saw recently she's trying to, quote, distance herself from the Biden administration. That was a real political article. How is that possible? She was the vice president. Did so, you see how she said, I'm going to do all these things on day one. And Trump called you're her in out office. I, <laughs> how you're the vice president of the United States. <laughs> I feel like I'm living in a bizarre world. Did you came up to Biden and said, you know, what do you, are you concerned that Vice President Kamala Harris is going to try to distance herself from your economic agenda? And he goes, no, there's no difference. We're on the same page. We're on the same. We're, you know, it's like, OK, so I guess you can't do that either. It's like, you know, are, the, are you running from his record or are you going to embrace it? Yeah, I don't I don't understand the thought process there. I mean, you get a little bit more into the strategy. I pulled up. Uh, so on her YouTube channel, she actually posted a video of uh, an interview. And no, it wasn't an interview with the press. It was an interview with Tim Waltz. And I swear it looks like it's produced by Aaron Sorkin to be the next great political drama. But I have to say, my first instincts were like, this is this is smart. This is smart. Basically, she sat down. They talked about music. They talked about food. They made jokes about white people, um, all the good stuff. And I, I, I saw Matt Walsh get upset about the joke about white people saying it was racist. I thought that was uh, come on, Matt. Give me a break. I don't it's think just, it's, it's, it's a common joke. OK, here, here, let's show the clip then. And what is like that black, like mayonnaise and tuna? What are you doing? Pretty, sorry. Like I have white guy tacos and what is like that black, like mayonnaise and tuna? What are you doing? Pretty much ground beef and cheese. That's and OK. The, Do yeah. you put any flavor in it? Uh, no. Oh. Um, here's the deal. <laughs> <laughs> no, they said to be careful and let her know this, that black pepper is the top of the spice level in Minnesota. You know, I'm the first vice president, I believe, okay. who has ever grown chili peppers. I'm you trying know, to expand I, my, we'll uh, my food uh, knowledge. You know, what? we've got some cantaloupes. You'll be fine. Yeah. Well, actually, Thomas Jefferson was vice president. And hey. he, great, he grew those peppers too. So, eh. but I will say this: like Matt Walsh got upset, like, oh, it's a joke, it's an anti-white racist joke, dude. You know what's not? The guy's from Minnesota. I'm from Minnesota. Minnesota is known for being like super bland, like not doing crazy spices. That's funny. Except I mean, for the Somalians. I'm, I'm actually the exception to that, though. I love Cajun food. I love spicy stuff or whatever. So. I just don't like living in the South because it's too hot for me, but um, you know, whatever, it's fine. I mean, I, so I think, I guess what Matt Walsh is getting at is like, but if we did this, you call us racist. Yeah. Okay. So when they do that, you say they're stupid and that's baloney. Right. You don't go, Oh, suddenly it's racist to say, well, white people from Minnesota or, or don't like spices. So I, I mean, want to, but Josh, I had a point I wanted to make on this because I watched this video talking about Springsteen, Seeger, old cars. They did it in Detroit. And th like the first comment came up and I was like, honestly, this is kind of my sentiment. Uh, it says there's a chemistry between these two, a certain charm, and also what at least appears like an authentic desire to do some good by serving the public. Trump and MAGA world is just destroying the people you don't like reality TV drama. Now, the irony of this comment was I watched this video. It's edited to the gills. I mean, I watched a lot of cuts. The way that they staged everything was very intentional. Uh, if you ever see like someone cut away 
to the back of someone's head when they're talking, usually it means that uh, they're connecting two cuts of audio and making it seamless into one. Right. And I actually thought, I'm thinking more, they're really sticking to this line of a campaign of making it feel like a movie, making it feel like um, a TV show or something like that. But I think what, what the right wing people are, exactly. I think what right wing people are missing about this is people like movies, people like TV shows. An example that came up was Aaron Sorkin, right? Aaron Sorkin famously did the social network and I think he did newsroom as well, but he, he makes these really uh, easy to watch slick productions that probably lack a lot of truth. I know that Zuck was pretty mad about his portrayal in it. And then also the newsroom as well. But, oh, that Jeff Daniels being the, the news anchor from that newsroom one and giving that speech, the kid goes, isn't America the best country? And he just rips on our country for about three minutes and liberals love to send that around. Right. It's like celebrating anti-patriotism. It's like, a, I'd like to give a big old fashioned son of a sailor. Understood. Middle finger to that guy but for the, that. the point I'm making about this is, uh, people are missing the point. This is effective to the target that they're going for. And they're going to continue this vibes campaign because the way that this was edited, it did make them look like they had chemistry. It did make her sound great. It did make him look like a charming old man because they have the luxury of doing that because they don't have to do hostile media. And if you don't do hostile media, then you never have to sound hostile. They haven't had to sound hostile one time. It's not a marathon. It's a sprint to the finish. Right. I mean, you know, there's 80 some days. They they think they can run it out. So I was even talking to Rosie about this before. Like, is there a... Is there a Trump equivalent? Is there something for the Trump campaign to learn from this kind of strategy? Like, do they even have the luxury of being able to do this? I'm not sure they do it. They, it's funny. Even in this video, they talked about the Harris campaign being an underdog campaign, which okay, hilarious to me, this. but okay. they do kind of have a point because yeah, they did get swapped in, in the ninth hour and now they have an uphill climb supposedly, even though they have all the support. I don't know. Well, okay, so we talked about this a little bit before. What I, I think Vice President Vance, the nominee, I should say he's not the vice president yet, but J.D. Vance should do kind of more of that kind of gonzo stuff he did before where he goes up to the plane for Air Force Two and said, hey, has Kamala come out and talked to you guys yet? Have she done any press conferences? Are you guys getting lonely because you don't get to talk to her? Like, that was awesome. That kind of verve, that kind of, you know, moxie. We need more of that. And actually... Trump is so used to this, getting out in front of a rally and having like 50,000 people just say the greatest things about him and all that kind of stuff. I agree with that. But what about what if Donald Trump did some old school retail politics? Like it's so because he's so good at the rally. But imagine him going into like a Cracker Barrel in like, you know, rural Pennsylvania. Like that would be, they would freaking love that. They would love him. Like do something different and just start chatting with people, shaking hands and, and just giving an impromptu comment or whatever. It would be so outside the norm. Like, and he could just be sort of himself. And I think that, would you know, he's got to start doing some of these other things t- to kind of mix things up, I think. Yeah. And I even saw, here's a tweet coming up. The, another interesting thing that I think is really backfiring. If you look on the strategy front is these kind of pictures coming out of JD Vance. Now, a couple things come to mind. This is this goofy picture of him with girls when pretending he's in to high school, right? He's in high school. And I think this was found on Facebook. So an interesting thought is that JD Vance is the first candidate to be young enough to even have Facebook, old Facebook stuff, play a part in high school. He was in high school on Facebook. That's what cracks me up. Like I, Oh my but Josh, gosh, look I at this was, picture. I already graduated from college and then several years later, Facebook's invented. So JD like, Vance looks like he chugs Mountain Dew and plays Halo till like three in the morning. That is, this is like the <laughs> face of that. If anything, that makes me like him more. I, I think a lot of people are like, okay, this is kind of ridiculous. Like he was a kid in high school. There's another picture of him like laying on the ground after drinking in college and like, okay, again, I know you're trying to get this guy's being weird. He is like the most normal dude of all time. And and funny enough, you look at the flip side of these weird people his age, like the Pete Buddha judges of the world who have these like carefully manicured, perfect record, no background to speak of. That's creepy to me. You've manicured your entire life to be free of like political ammo for other people. And it's like J.D. Vance just keeps coming out as like, all right, he's like a normal dude. Like, yeah, he drank in college. Gotcha. He baked baked goods for a transgender classmate in law school. Gotcha. Like, wh- what are we getting him on here? I, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how social media plays 
more of a role in future candidates as like, there's just so much out there of everyone now. Yeah. They post, there's a, and if you already said it, they posted a picture of him that he was like drunk in the corner, falling asleep or whatever in college. Cause he had too many beers. It's like, Oh, wait a minute. Hold on <laughs> gotcha. a second. You're telling me that a Marine drank too many beers one time. Shocking news film at 11. I've never heard that before. <laughs> I mean, news. just to give you an idea, my father-in-law was a Marine. And he served in uh, Iceland. And I'm not even kidding you. The Marines in Iceland, there have been several times where they drank so much beer that Ireland ran out of booze. I'm not even joking. Like there was nothing left. <laughs> These are our Marines. I'm just telling you. Yeah, he was a Marine too. You can throw stones at them, but when, when, when war comes a knocking, you want them ready. Oh, for sure. The boys, next man up. Shout out to the Marines. We've got any Marines in the chat. I think we do have a few Marines in the chat. John, John has a picture in a Marine get up. So thank you for your service. So, well, I mean, if we're going to talk about Marines, let me just indulge you for a minute here before we go on. Like we were talking about, I guess, EWTN here next week or so is going to redo the documentary on Father Vincent Capadano. He's the missionary, oh, yeah. he's the priest. They call him the grunt padre because he served with the priests in Vietnam. And uh, um, actually, my again, my father-in-law was in Vietnam at the time. So was my dad. They were in the same area for three months in northern Vietnam. They didn't know each other then, but um, anyway, so Father Vincent Cabadano was there and he offered to, you know, to, he was going to celebrate mass. And my father-in-law at the time was Lutheran. And he said, I, you know, can I go to the mass? You know, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not Catholic. I'm Lutheran. We're back. We're so back. In the words of Jeb Bush, it's over. We are back. No, not Jeb Bush. He's the low energy. We need the high energy right now. Let's go. It's one of my favorite, favorite quotes from Jeb Bush, other than him being called low energy Jeb. How about this? Please clap. <laughs> Isn't uh, Kamala Harris famous for that too? Or is that Biden? I, I don't know. I think Biden's famous for uh, end quote, repeat the line. Yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So what we got, apparently you said uh, Rosie collected a bunch of these questions from the audience. Yeah, we got a few. Let's get uh, on this stuff. And then, yeah, keep keep throwing them in right now. So we're going to go into the FAQs now, part of the show. FAQ Friday, as it's known. And I think some people are still kind of piling in, so hopefully we don't give advice too quick. But right now, we have a question from... Man, I'm going to struggle. We have Schwaster? Schwatster? Schwatster. Um, need a little bit of explanation on that name, Schwatster. But the question that he put up is, too much politics are always a soul-sucking blech for me. But I know that I can detox by putting it on silent treatment for a few weeks. I know politics are your day job. How do you guys keep your heart, head, soul, et cetera, in check doing this full time? It's a good question. Honestly, number one is I go to confession a lot, actually. Honestly. Big facts. You know, I make a point of going, you know, at least every month uh, for me because it is uh, it, it's a difficult enterprise. Um, you know, I, I think about people who are working different fields that are that are kind of difficult, you know, like when you're in the medical field, they talk about the gallows humor, like the kind of jokes that you have to do just because otherwise you can get too emotional about what is going on before you and you just need to perform as a professional. And so these sort of are coping mechanisms that humans have sort of developed. But honestly, you know, yeah, for me, it's, you know, obviously I do the, you know, prayer life. I try to do better about that and I try to read for things. But like for me, I always try to think about with politics. I want to win, obviously, right? It's not just a, it's not the, it's not a debate club. I actually want victory because I want fewer children aborted and I want fewer children, you know, mangled in genital, genital mutilation. And I'd like to see our country return to prosperity. And I do think the 10, you know, the 10 commandments and the constitution and the bill of rights are a way for human flourishing. So I, I'm very proud to fight on behalf of this stuff. Right. And so, but it is kind of a, a grind at times and it can be kind of grimy and, and you have to fight back and people name call and the people who are in power don't want to let go of their power. And so, yeah, it can be difficult at times, but I, I, I'm reminded of this. Christ wins in the end. And that means, you know, I have that confidence and, and, and assurance. Um, and so whatever it may be, I know he gave his life for all of us. I can afford to take a few arrows. So let's fight on. Yeah. 
Um, agree with a lot of what you said. If I could add on a, so I have more like strategic thoughts and more practical thoughts. I think, uh, th- and this is true for any profession, but especially in a profession that's heavily online, it's important to be in the know, but it's important to have uh, sincere breaks. And for me, I really try to, like when I get home, have a long period of time where I don't have my phone on me, don't have technology on me. So having intentional breaks from being completely plugged in. And then I love um, sports. I've always loved sports, but I like to do, like I like to play golf, right? So I golf on Mondays. And when I golf, I don't have my phone with me. And that's just a period of time where I'm focused on one thing, play pickup basketball. Um, I play guitar. Like I like to do things that are removed from screens and I can think about mastering something else. And it really is therapeutic for my mind and to work towards excellence in those areas and just to appreciate, you know, how my body's made, how my mind is made, being able to create music, being able to play a sport. Like I love being, it's almost like when I do that, everything just kind of works out for itself. It feels very natural to me. And I like being in that zone and it always gives me energy for the other things I have to do, like going to work. And then one thing I'd recommend actually to all professionals. So I've been just recently been praying a uh, prayer to St. Joseph, the worker, and it's crazy already. The benefits that I've had personally of just starting out my day to have that mindset. And a few things from that prayer really stick out to me. One Um, it talked about working in a spirit of penance and with a true sincerity. And I think in this business, it's really easy, especially like in the social media era to let the medium that you're on determine how you act. It can kind of turn you into a jerk, um, without you knowing overnight. And I've definitely been a jerk. And as Josh said, confession is important platform, right? Right. It's like you, you, your, the medium becomes your message. And so it's important when you, I start and when I don't do this, I can feel it. But when I start the day off with that prayer, Uh, I think about what I'm doing. It changes how I act. It changes how I talk. It changes how I think. And so it's important to kind of have those those resets um, in that as well. And we are, I think Josh alluded to this too. I do this because I believe in something good. I'm not doing this as like a negative bad faith actor. I sincerely believe that the Catholic faith and the Catholic church and lay Catholics in America have something to contribute to the political process, to their local community. It's not because I hate something. It's because I believe in something. And I just think from my observations on the outside, conservative Catholics especially have been kind of demonized. Orthodox Catholics have been demonized when it comes to the political process. And there's so many good people that, and and especially doing this, I've realized this too. So many people have reached out and been like, I'm so glad. I appreciate your program. I appreciate what you're doing. And sometimes when I'm working, I'm like, I don't feel like I'm saying anything super insightful or out of the box or crazy. You know, I'm not inventing anything. But the longer I think about it, it's like we are just providing a place for people to feel that their opinions are validated and that they have a community. And I think if you look at how the media landscape is dominated right now, it's really dominated by left-leaning voices. I think that's changing for sure. But especially in Catholicism, you get the very cheap surface level, welcome the stranger type arguments against really sincere um, logical positions that we don't need to cede to the left or to liberals. Like I, I think conservative Orthodox, Orthodox Catholics have so much to offer in that regard. So I am really happy that I can build, well, we can build this community. We can, we can be effective and, you know, be a strong coalition. The left goes against human nature. And so they need to create this idea of consensus and that everyone believes in this thing and they have to gin up propaganda because they're totally going against everything that isn't is natural to humans so yeah i mean to be able to burst come by and burst that bubble it's not that you and i are seeing anything particularly unique or you know it's just like hey this is the the emperor's wearing no clothes this is garbage yeah believe this yeah and look if i got to be the one to say it and i got to be the one because i i do understand like people in different jobs there's so much self-censorship that happens where they're like "Ah, i don't want to say what i really think you know because I, i don't want to lose my job or i don't want to whatever and being in this position, I have the support and luxury to go say exactly what I think on pretty much everything. I don't have to worry about repercussions. And hopefully that can encourage, courage is a little bit contagious. Like I, I want to basically create positions to be normal. Like the greatest example I saw of that was like the trans, uh, like a man swimming against uh, Riley Gaines, like Will Thomas, Leah Thomas. How many people were scared to say what they really thought on that? 
for fear of repercussion against internet mob, their employer, yada, yada, yada. But if you think about that for more than two seconds, it's like there's real victims to this. Like people that had to be in that locker room are victims. People that are losing out an opportunity are victims. Like we're, we're because we can't say what we really think and for adults to come in the room and be adults, you know, we let this I evil agree. be rampant. And not only that, it's supported by Catholics too, which is crazy to me. There's progressive Catholics that are wrapped up in that movement. I'm happy to, you know, try to work against that. So, Hey, it looks like we got another question here in the chat from Dom Higgy. Any relationship advice for young Catholics? My girlfriend and I have been together three months. Okay, so. Oh, don't worry, Dom. We were going to get to you. I had that one written down. All right. So. <laughs> Any thoughts, Josh? Look, I know I, I you know, I, yesterday was the 20th anniversary of the first date I went on with my wife. And I, and so that was on the Feast of the Assumption. And uh, it didn't take me long to find out this lady was the, the one for me. I proposed to her in November, and we were married in July. So we were married. Uh, and actually, that was the thing, too. Like, we met in the Diocese of Lansing, and they had a nine-month waiting period before we could get married. I'm like, dude, I'm already 26 or 27. I'm not going to wait this long. This is crazy. So we did marriage prep in her diocese because it was only six months. And I thought, I get that you're trying to make sure that marriages are, are for real, but, like, this is ridiculous. So six months, yeah, fine. That six months is fine. But like, come on, man. It's, I've been waiting for the right girl forever, you know? <laughs> I mean, yeah, but anyway, so what I, you know, unsolicited advice to people, you know, I think you need to have a common understanding of certain things, you know, like, um, you know, do you have the same faith tradition? And within Catholics, you know, again, we all know a lot about this. There's a lot of Catholics, oh yeah, I'm Catholic, but then it doesn't really mean that much to them. And then all of a sudden you're like, they they basically are secular in many ways and they just happen to go to church on Sunday. So obviously you need to make sure you and your girlfriend are on the same page with regards to church teachings and orthodoxy, obviously that. But then also, how do you look at certain things in life? And now that can be very instructive. So how do you look at children? Like, are you like, well, we'll have a couple of children or whatever. Or are you like, I want to have as many children as God will give me. You know, like, that's a difference. You need to talk through those things, you know. And I, within, like, the second date, Lori and I are like, oh, we're already coming up with names for kids we like. You know, like, it was pretty crazy. Yeah, we're going to have seven, eight, nine kids. How many ever God will give us? Sure. But we're on the same page on that. And then also, here's another thing that a lot of conservative Catholics kind of overlook. You need to look at it like what it okay, how are we going to talk about money? And how are we going to think about what money is? And I kind of like, you know, Dave Ramsey try to eliminate debt as much as possible. I, I'm, I'm, I'm for that. That's good. Sure. But in general, you need to have the same approach. I love my mom and my dad, obviously, super much. But they had a very, very, very different approach to money. And they would constantly be upset at each other over it. And I would just like to kind of give an example of how this kind of came out and why you should be thinking about this and why it matters. Okay. So my father, as I mentioned, served in Vietnam and he was a medic and there, there's, and the guy's like, Hey Paul, we're going to go, we're going to go to the P, the PX and go buy some supplies. You want to come? He's like, Oh yeah, sure. Great. And he jumps onto the helicopter. Okay. They're going to take these two helicopters to go to the base to get some supplies. And then all of a sudden he looks he's like, Oh wait, Oh man, I forgot my wallet. He jumps out of the helicopter. He says, don't leave. Runs back to get his wallet. And he comes back and the helicopter took off. <laughs> He's like, you jerks. He gets onto the <laughs> second helicopter and the two helicopters are going over and some guy in the rice paddy comes up with a missile and blows up the entire first helicopter, killing all the men on board. If my father had remembered his wallet at the beginning, I would not be alive. Wow. I would not exist. And that was a very humbling moment for him. And he thought to himself, oh, my goodness, there but for the grace of God go I. And so he looks at it like, hey, let's go on that vacation. Let's do this. There might not be a tomorrow. So he takes that as a way of looking at how he spends his money. All right. And I had to tell my mom. My mom grew up in you know farmland, everything. You're stretching every dollar. She was the first of 11 kids. She didn't get any luxuries at all. And she talked about how her dad had a dollar bill when he served in World War II and he went to all the different ports and he'd, you know, he'd write down Okinawa or he'd write down wherever he was at. 
And it was such a formative thing. And, and my mom thought how many times he could have used that dollar to buy stuff, but he didn't because he wanted to remember where he was and the friends he lost at all these battles, right? Wow. How much he cherished, how little money he had. And so you would never spend money frivolously. So these two people are very good people. I love them both, my mother and father. But they had such a diametrically different view of how they looked at money. And they couldn't even see how the other person saw it. So it's very important to kind of walk through these things and talk through this stuff. Because you really have to understand, like, then you get offended. Because it's like, she would look at him spending money kind of maybe frivolously. And it's like, oh my gosh, it's like you're... It's like you're spitting on my 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 dad and how how he spent money, or you know she, he would be like, oh my gosh, like you're not gonna let me go to a movie. I could have been dead in 1967. Like give me a break. But they didn't say it like that. They just kind of kept those feelings inside and it bubble up. You need to work through these things. And I and I observed this kind of stuff from my own my own mom and my dad so many times that my wife kind of jokingly calls me Doctor Phil. She's like, oh my gosh, you want to talk things to death. My wife loves to talk all day long about everything. But when we talk about something where we have a dispute, she's so against getting in arguments. She's like, oh my gosh, your mom and dad like to argue all the time. I don't want to do this. But I tell you, when it comes to, to money, when it comes to kids, when it comes to some of these things, it is so important that you guys have an approach and you think about how you're doing this kind of stuff because – You've got to work some of these things out. God, how many times did Jesus talk about money in the Bible? A lot. A lot. Why? Money. Who cares about money? Money isn't, is not is only a means to something, but it is your livelihood. You work all day to earn the money you can to get the things to feed your family, to do the things you want to do. So it is important. And how you think about it and how you think about your faith and how you think about your children, they matter. And actually, priests should talk about all this stuff a lot more than they do. Josh, I see the resemblance to Dr. Phil. I mean, I get, are like, <laughs> I get it. I get it. I mean, look, Dr. Phil isn't sexy, and he's on TV. They put him on there for a reason, because he's smart, just like me. There you go. Uh, I mean, look, you and I, Tom, this is great. We're the we're the bald and the beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you stole that from a coworker. That one was used on you. Um Dom, first off, congrats, man. Sick to be to have a girlfriend, to be dating three months. That's that's awesome. I, I Josh gave a lot of red meat. I'll give less red meat, maybe. You can never get flowers for your partner enough. So that's something I've kept into marriage. Maybe my advice is more like marriage based now. Partner, I'm just, it's for your girl. Girls get flowers. well, your girl. Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm saying for your for your girl. Okay. Yeah. I'm assuming, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, girls can't get flowers. Don't need to get enough. Guy, get, girls don't need to get the guys. I don't know what flowers. I would do with flowers. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what the male equivalent of flowers is. But if you surprise them by ba- making a big steak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I think a lot of what Josh said is is true. I think just in my experience, it we started having serious conversations so quickly um, because we were just on the same page about so many things. I think it's a huge help to have your faith as a central part of your oh. relationship. I hope that, you know, you date someone that shares it. But for, for me personally, like I see that pay dividends now in my marriage of, uh, we always, you know, went to mass together. We started dating in college. So, our, and we went to a Catholic college. So faith was completely central because there's just so many times where you will come up short or she will come up short and it's easy to get angry at each other about those things. But when you have like a bigger mission, a bigger connection beyond those kind of petty everyday things. Um, it's not uh, cliche to say, you know, you should be, um, you should have the cross at the forefront. One, one thing that we did as a marriage tradition, it's a Croatian marriage tradition. We did the Croatian cross marriage trad- tradition where you hold on to a cross as you say your vows, and then you hang that cross above your bed. And the idea is, is that that's where you go whenever you have problems or whenever you have a strife. And so you have that above your bed and that's where you go. You kneel and you pray before that. Um, and we've done that, um, many times. Um, and so, yeah, just, just enjoy it, man. I'd say just really cherish it. I'd be serious about, you know, what your intentions are. I think, especially as you, I don't know how old you are, but especially if you're in your, your twenties, like it doesn't take a lot of time. I, my hot, I don't know. This is a hot take. I'm not a huge fan of long engagements. No, I was engaged. Either. No way. Um, in college because I had to be, but really like, if you know, 
it, it you should not be you know dating for five years or engaged super long. Like if you know, get to the altar, get it going. You know, get your life going. There's no reason to delay that. Um, all it can lead is to um, just candidly like sexual temptation. Clearly, you should be attracted to who you're dating, and um, you want to be united. You want to be completely intimate, and the best way to, the, the the best way to do that is through marriage, through the sacrament of marriage. So. Um, yeah, and I feel also, like I'm I want giving to a good ones. A 24 law school. Thing. Okay, sick. I'm going to do a little addendum. Like, get rid of this happy wife, happy life stuff. Hate that. And the idea is that we just need to make sure the wives are happy. Like, I, men should try to serve their wives and their children. And wives should also try to serve their children. We should all try to, you know, it's like, it's not happy wife, happy life. It's happy spouse, happy house. We all should be concerned about making each other happy happy and be pointing towards God and serving others and doing things right. But I, you know, we had this in the last 20, 30 years. It's like, make sure the wife gets happy. And you know what? That's not, that's, uh, if that's the only focus, no, we're building something together. Like, that's what I keep, you know, my wife and I can say, this is, we're building a household. This is a reality. And we're in this together and we love it. And that's what it's all about. Oh, and when, if you guys are getting close to engagement, so we had a weird, we got married around COVID. So we had a weird process. Highly recommend. There's a book called Better Together. It's actually a dynamic uh, Catholic product, but this was one of the best things that my wife and I ever did. Started a ton of conversations we didn't even know we wanted to have. So Better Together, highly recommend. It starts with a passage that made me cry straight, straight away. It's something I buy for friends that are engaged. Um, is one of the best things we ever did. Started a lot of those good conversations, but Dom Higgy, excited for you, dude. That's exciting. So uh, final question do we have. Okay, yeah, final question before we have to move on to the Twilight Zone here. We should make this a regular segment so we get more questions. We got, uh, are you excited about season two of Rings of Power coming out at the end of the month? Now, here's this is the take that might get people to leave this program. I've never watched Lord of the Rings. I've never read any of the books. I haven't watched any of the movies. I think I might have watched one because I had to. It was one of the later Hobbits or whatever. Um, my take on it, it's big freaks versus little freaks. And that's how I know who the good guys and the bad guys are. So I, at this point, I haven't seen it. And people get so mad when I say I haven't seen it or read it. I almost enjoy how mad people get about it. And I'm in too deep. So my compromise is I think that I will probably watch slash read with my kids when they get old enough as my meat in the middle, but I'll probably continue just being annoying and not seeing it. So, Oh, Josh, we can't hear you now. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> this is the, sorry. This is the greatest I, episode ever. Second, Cause you're going, no, I'm good. Um, my take on the Lord of the Rings is I find it boring. Wow. Okay. We can't cause Erica would probably defend it. So this now, feels here's wrong. The thing. I even tried it. I'm like, okay, Liv Tyler, she's kind of cute. I mean, the next gal, I'll watch it, whatever. And I, not even that. Uh, was, sorry. I couldn't do it. <laughs> Erica would defend it. We already I have. Feel, I'm a Viking. I can't watch these little, <laughs> these little, little people. Like, it's what, like, come on. I'm tired of these extended universe movies, too. Like, people need to come up with original ideas. I'm tired of them milking, like, Marvel and all that. I feel like they're doing that with Lord of the Rings. So, ridiculous. All right. Yeah, Erica's missed big time. <laughs> she might retain most of her audience here, but it's, it's more in the fantasy character category. I like the sci-fi stuff. I don't know, like these stories about three foot people. It's... Yeah, you're you're not a fantasy guy. Let's see if I can screen share here because I got a weird. Again, we're in a weird situation here. Uh, uh, na, 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 na. That was like my college friend paid me Sweet. offered to pay me ten bucks if I watch that Titanic. I'm like, yep, not happening. <laughs> Not a Titanic guy. All right. So my Twilight Zone. And thank you guys for the question. Sorry if we didn't get all to get to all of them, but would love to start doing this more regularly to get what's on the chat's mind. So my Twilight Zone this week is, you know, Catholics for Harris, guys. It was supposed to be yesterday. I was looking forward to it. I was going to crash. And we get this email saying, dear friends, we wish you and your loved ones a happy feast of the Assumption. Due to a scheduling conflict, the Biden Walls campaign has postponed tonight's call with grassroots Catholic supporters until after the Democratic convention. As soon as more information is available, we'll be in contact. Contact until then, keep the faith, Catholic for Harris. Now, a few problems with this. One, they said Biden Walls campaign. Wait, no. Did they in the email? They said it in the email. Come on, guys. <laughs> 
Ruh Ruh Raggy. Tough for tough for the copy too. And as I pointed out, Catholics for Harris getting canceled on a Marian solemnity is perfect because thinking Catholics would support her was a huge assumption. Oh. So <laughs> I yeah, I don't and it's funny they didn't even cancel it because it was on a feast day. They canceled it because of a scheduling conflict. So <laughs> Catholic for Harris in shambles. You know, the know. Catholic for Harris guy, I told him, you want to come on the Lucas, we can talk about this stuff. He didn't take me up on the effort, though. Was he, he was the one that maybe hacked the stream. That's why we went down. Retaliation <laughs> for, for me making puns about his poorly run initiative. I uh, love it. Don yeah. Hagee, chickens for KFC, yes. It's so perfect. All right, Josh, what you got? All right, I mean, what do you mean? I've been, I don't have a Twilight Zone. Let me ask another question. I didn't, honestly, it's been All right. a crazy morning. So let's just do another question. All right, another question. Let's see. Should parents be responsible for paying for their children's college education? Oh, for real. That's funny. I'm literally writing checks today to speak of it. Thoughts? As um, doing. I mean, look, I, you know, I, I unfortunately don't live, I live in Michigan. There's no school choice here. So I'm paying a, a ton for the 13 years that they go through that K-12 education. Um, I, I, I'm not gonna leave my kids totally hanging out to dry. Um, I said, I can't support, I can only do like maybe one fifth of what the cost is, but the rest has to be on you. You need to understand is this makes sense. And we sat down, we talked about it and looked at it. Like they're gonna give you this scholarship you're going to have to borrow this kind of money and you're going to have to pay it off over time because I have six kids. I have to be responsible for everyone. I can't just give you the farm and then come back. So, but to me, it would be, I can understand some parents, you know, like Jan saying, don't do any. Yeah, fine. You know, the thing is, um, you know, I, it, it's kind of unrealistic to say, I'm going to do, I'm going to pay five, six grand for her for each year she's in high school and then do zero dollars when she gets to college. So I'm not going to do that, but I just said, it's going to be like this and you have to pay it off. And then I use that money and then to pay for the other kids so that they can get through. But I, I do want to champion this idea. I want to make sure parents understand if you, you can do sometimes a lot of times dual enrollment with community colleges or whatever. Um, I know that in Michigan, we can do that. So my kid was, uh, went to math class at the community college and they had that counter for her math credit for college already. And so she did that her senior year. Um, I also am very big on Franciscan University has two different initiatives, one of which is dual enrollment. So any kid in, who's a junior in high school or a junior or a senior in high school can go to Franciscan dual enrollment. You pay like 450 bucks for a class, which is 85 percent discount. And my daughter is going to be a junior. She took sociology this summer. So she took the class from Franciscan. It's college credit. You're saving money. I got you, Jan. Okay. Um, and then they have another thing. So that's a great option. So you can do those classes while you're in, and save a ton of money while you're still in high school. Maybe do one, two at a time, whatever. They also have another thing. If you are going to a Chesterton High School or if you're doing like a Colby Homeschool Academy stuff, you can actually get the, the high school classes that you're already taking, whether it's chemistry, philosophy, you know, history, whatever. And you can take tests through Franciscan University and get college credit for those classes, as many as 24 credit hours in your junior and senior years total. And so my, we only found out about this a little bit late, so my first daughter didn't get as much of that done. But dude, my, all the rest of my kids, they could end up being graduating from high school and be equivalent, basically a college sophomore already. And so those are opportunities I think I, I, I can't say enough about it. Go to Franciscan check out their dual enrollment program. And if you go to a Chesterton school, which my kids go to Chesterton High School, find out about that Advantage program that they have. Those are great ways uh, you can save some serious moolah. Yeah. I think on a just a principal level, I don't think you owe it. Like you, you don't owe to your children to pay for their college education. Uh, however, you know, if you have the opportunity to uh, and you think it would be good for them and effective then I think it's great if people can. I know for me personally, like my dad helped me out a little bit. Um, but you know, I have three brothers and it's expensive and 
I, I think it also depends too. Like it's, it varies child per child. Like if you have a really motivated child who knows where they want to go, know what they want to do, working in, in the same plan, like as Josh, as you said, like going to a Catholic school, wants to work to pay it off. Like those are all good signs. I, I think it would be a different conversation if you're like, oh, I kind of have a kid. I'm not sure how it's going to end up and we're going to drop 40 K on him to go to Michigan state or whatever. Um, probably not. So I think it varies situation to situation. It's nice to get a little bit of help. There's a lot of ways to hack the system. I think it has to make sense. Um, and, and back to the Catholic school perspective, even just for me, I'm just thinking about how different my life turned out because I went to Ave Maria. Like I met my wife there. I formed a lot of my like faith and formed a lot of my academic opinions there. I got great access to incredible professors. So if I would have gone somewhere else, I'm curious how it would have turned out. So much of college at Ave Maria was the community and the fact that everyone lived on campus and, and we did have sacraments available to, available to us all the time. And we were away from a lot of things. So it almost kind of felt like a retreat. It was very formative. So I, I really think if it's good, if your child is built for college and you think they'll succeed, they have a good plan and you want to send them to a place where they can meet a future spouse so they can really form themselves. Like I'd be more than happy to help my, my children do that. But in the same way, I'd be happy if I had a child who was um, good with their hands and wanted to do something in the trades. I'd be happy to support that as well. I'm not just saying like has to go to college. I want to look at all options for sure. Cause I think every child is different, but just a long answer short. I mean, uh, no one owes that I think to their children, but it's great if you can. Yeah. Give them assistance and help them understand that they need to work for, for it as well. I mean, it's going to make them a better person long term if they understand that they have to roll up their sleeves and get to work. So don't give them everything, obviously. But, yeah. you know, give them a give them a give them a good assist. Obviously, yeah, that's like my biggest fear is like raising entitled children, because I I recognize that in other people, and it's one of my least favorite qualities in anyone. Period. Um, you know, sorry, George I think Bush often. when uh, you know. Um, in the early 1990s, he asked Karl Rove to put together a report on what had happened to the children of presidents. And he looked over this report, with the exception of John Quincy Adams, it was a sad, sad, sad history of people who just coasted, didn't do anything, they became losers, and he just said, I got to I got to turn my life around. And so then he's like, I'm going to, you know, so he gets involved, with, becomes president of the Texas Rangers, runs for governor, and he, I think he was a crappy president, I, but at least, you know, he understood you don't want to have entitled children. <clears throat> you need to make a, your, a career for yourself, excuse me, a career for yourself. And uh, so, I mean, that's incumbent upon all of us to make sure we don't raise entitled brats. Yep.